Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for join, uh, joining us uh, for today's AIWA Los Angeles Las Vegas Sections e Town Hall meeting on June 5th, 2021. Uh, we have two uh, amazing talks and a very uh, good speakers and a panelist on very important topics. So uh, uh, we should enjoy uh, the event today. So before that, we have a few uh, announcement and uh, logistic to uh, explain. <clears throat> So first of all, thanks a lot to AIWA National Office Headquarters. This Zoom platform was provided by, by them and it's actually very expensive with many features. Uh, so how do you appreciate? Uh, the first presentation, Industry uh, 4.0 is going to be recorded, uh, but not the second topic for aviation safety uh, investigation. Uh, if somehow you got disconnected, please keep trying to reconnect. It should be just temporary. Uh, and for audio, if you have any bandwidth issues, you can try to use just the uh, dial-in uh, using the phone instead of using the uh, 3G, 4G, 5G, uh, or Wi-Fi. Um, <clears throat> and please sign in using your real name so people can know who you are. And if you don't type any question or text, uh, people won't know you are here. Uh, I mean, for attendees. Um, if you like to interact, uh, networking with each other, please uh, type something in a Q&A or chat box. And please direct your question in the Q&A box at the end of the each of the presentation. Uh, if you raise hand, we'll uh, unmute you. So uh, we encourage you to speak out and interact with the speaker panelists. Uh, if you're concerned with uh, the privacy or security, please use the web version of the Zoom uh, and don't download the app. If you are working a defense contractor uh, or some aerospace company, they might have some strict rules. Uh, and they use, you, 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 then talk, don't talk about any sensitive issues, personal information. Uh, just a few words for Southern California. As you know, uh, Southern California is very heavily aerospace populated. Uh, not only we have people, a company like Air, um, Northrop Grumman building James Webb Space Telescope, uh, they're also building uh, the Super Hornet and the F F F35, uh, part of assembly or something like that, uh, and many other exciting things, space station. And we also have SpaceX just next door to us uh, doing exciting, you know, uh, launches for, uh, uh, you know, uh, space station. And now they are doing the Starship. Uh, then we have uh, electric hybrid aircraft, sustainable aviation, the Mars 2020, very exciting, JPL, Aerospace Corporation, Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit, and many student brand uh, activities. And uh, manufacturing is a very big issue in this area. So uh, you will see is uh, the first talk, first panel discussion is very important. Uh, so we keep doing events, you know, to keep uh, people informed, uh, various topic to inspire people. Uh, these events are actually to provide the platform for networking, but unfortunately to pandemic is a little limited, but uh, we still encourage people to speak out to uh, get the interaction. Uh, we also have newsletter opportunities. So we will have article or screenshots for the events and we have a professional educational article as well. This is one for May that we uh, post article for uh, the late uh, astronaut Michael Collins. <clears throat> And we also post with the permission from the speaker, then we post event in, on YouTube, uh, in our AWA Las Vegas second channel, and also on our website. And we also have podcasts, you know, it's easier for people to listen. Then we also encourage arts, aerospace art, photo gallery, astrophotography, uh, those kinds of things. So if we have uh, this uh, uh, skill and hobby, then we welcome you to join us. And uh, we also do member spotlight, you know, uh, uh, like Lisa said, your president was former president of AIAA, and he, if he's still a member, we can uh, post a member spotlight on him as well. Uh, then we also have online engage. If you are a member, you can immediately sign in and uh, chat with uh, member uh, aerospace expert and uh, uh, members in, in around the world. You find opportunity, mentor, mentee, uh, opportunity. For example, this. Uh, in industry 4.0 or the uh, aviation safety, you can vote as a mentor or some kind of things. That's very exciting. 
Aerospace America is very big. It has a lot of inside insider story for aerospace. Somebody even got opportunity business uh, reading it. So it's very exciting. Then, oh, this is Aerospace America. Okay, so uh, we have many forums and uh, conferences and uh, you save a lot if you are a member. And uh, we do this, our membership chair. If you're a student member, you transition to professional, you got great discounts. And a different level or membership, for example, Mr. Elon Musk is our associate fellow and uh, Ms. Gwyn Shuthwell of SpaceX, who is actually running the SpaceX now is our honorary fellow. And the General Ellen Podikowski, the third woman four-star general is also our honorary fellow, Neil Armstrong, Bill Gersten, Meyer, Buzz Aldrin, Professor Speyer, they're all very distinguished, uh, you know, a member of AIAA. You can advance the levels. Uh, that's uh, one key feature of AIAA. And our section chair, Dr. Jeff Puchel, is a fellow. He's work, working in Raytheon. And uh, I show the name, Mr. Steve uh, Izakovich is our AIAA fellow. Mr. George Whiteside, the president, uh, CEO of uh, uh, Virgin Galactic is, is also associate fellow. Uh, so we do honor the members with long years. We did so um, last week. So, and uh, we also welcome new members. You know, we have dedicated men members, you know, even stay over 70 years. It's amazing. So if any new members, uh, please, you know, you can uh, welcome to step, step forward, type in chat box or raise your hand, you know, welcome to say a few words. Uh, the many we have many honors. Uh, the reason why I'm explaining this is that uh, many people didn't really understand what AIWA is. And uh, there are a lot of features we publish, we research, we educate, and we also honor people doing good job, inspire people to do uh, advance. And, you know, uh, this is very important. And if you're good in you know, speaking out and uh, we have lectureship as well. Um, so for example, this uh, doctor, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Bevelacqua, he was the inventor of the Vito, uh, you know, engine, and uh, he got the Daniel Guggenheim Medal Award. He's also our fellow, uh, distinguished lecturer. And uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Michimisa Fujino, the CEO of Honda Aircraft, and uh, he got the Reed uh, Award from AWA. Uh, then we also do uh, outreach. Uh, then we now have a new high school membership. Then we have national forum, for, uh, forums, and uh, these are the flagship uh, forum conferences. Uh, so it's uh, actually quite related to the topics uh, today. And then we keep doing events like quantum computing. Um, you know, this is uh, uh, our top uh, aircraft designer, Dr. Dan Raymer. He just designed a new manned Mars airplane. It's going to be the future. And uh, we have speaker from JPR talking about Juno, uh, Europa Clipper. And uh, there's a vice president from Virgin Orbit talking about uh, their recent successes uh, with uh, uh, those uh, uh, distinguished pilots and uh, was Mitchell, uh, Sir Richard Branson. And we have people from France uh, talking about uh, the clean aviation and the JPL speaker talking about climate change. And uh, the upper left is our section chair, Dr. Jeffrey Grishel. Uh, he could not be here today, uh, but he wants me to say hello to everyone. Lower left is the leader of the Ingenuity Mars Helicopter, Ms. Mimi Ong from Caltech JPL. Lower right is uh, the, the uh, deputy uh, leader for, for the uh, uh, EDL, the landing for Mars 2020 Perseverance, and upper right was the robotic uh, expert, Dr. Jeff DeLong. You know, they were talking about uh, the exciting landings, you know, on May 1st. And uh, as you know, the right field, <laughs> right brother fields on Mars is, uh, is very exciting in the Jezero crater. And uh, then we follow, we have an event follow up, you know, from Professor Jakowski talking about the Mars atmosphere and climate and uh, the possibility of terraforming Mars from a scientific, scientific engineering point of view. Uh, this is what I said, you know, we have happy hours and upper left was uh, uh, designed by a, a, a student from Canada. Uh, he made the CAD design and the 3D printed it and doing some simulations. And uh, in this event, 
uh, people share about their views in the aerospace and we have the space station virtual meeting place. And this month we, we are going to meet on <coughs> the, <coughs> I'm sorry, the virtual Mars space uh, on Mars. Uh, please join us. And uh, we also have uh, space nuclear power propulsion. Uh, this is a very hot topic these days. <clears throat> then we have the uh, Mr. Alan Chain uh, talking about the landing of Perseverance. And uh, we have a uh, member with many years anniversaries membership and uh, sharing the experience. Upper right is again our uh, session chair, doc Dr. Jack Purcell from Raytheon. Uh, again, this is a talk about landing on Mars. And uh, so I, I would just mention very quickly, you know, the names of our um, speaker panelists of the first uh, session. Uh, the moderator is Mr. Jay Douglas. He's the COO of the uh, Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute. He will lead the session and introduce in more detail uh, for the panelists. Uh, the, one of the panel, panel, next panelists is uh, Ms. Lisa. Um, Ms. Antonio is a, a Chief work, Workforce Officer, also in ARM. Uh, and uh, Ms. Robin uh, Bernkas is uh, from the D Department of Labor. Uh, is the Deputy Administrator of Office of Workforce Investment. This is very vital for us. Actually, we have a, a career and workforce development committee. Uh, so it's a very important subject. I wish to connect with Robin and everyone of you here uh, for continual effort. And uh, uh, we have Dr. Scott Lucas and uh, is Vice President of Aviation Manufacturing and Institutional uh, Effectiveness at uh, Wichita State University Campus of Applied Science and Technology. And he has background in aviation, and uh, we're hoping to learn more uh, for the link between manufacturing uh, industry 4.0 and uh, aerospace. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, uh, welcome all the panelists and uh, uh, the moderator. So Jay, is uh, all yours. Great, thanks, Ken. Uh, yep, so I'm Jay Douglas. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at um, the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute, a little bit about us. We're a public-private partnership uh, formed at the beginning of 2017. Uh, the public side of our business is uh, the United States Department of Defense. The private side as of last week is 310 companies, universities, and other nonprofits that are working with us through a series of projects to improve US manufacturing competitiveness and the capabilities of the United States Department of Defense supply chain and sustainment activities. Uh, to date, we've launched about 80 projects through teams of our members. Uh, like I said, we're a consortium, we're a membership organization. If there's uh, more information you'd like about us, you can, you can catch us at arm, arminstitute.org. Um, we're always looking for new people to join our team. Anyway, so thanks for being here today. The title of this panel is the Industry 4.0 Workforce Needs, Issues, and Solutions. And we have three really terrific panelists uh, to be with us today. Uh, the core of the session is about manufacturers across the United States frequently respond that a lack of a skilled workforce is their number one issue. The increasingly fast pace of automation coupled with a lack of consistency around competencies and career pathways make it harder for education seekers to identify which programs can lead to the best jobs. Employers are challenged to find qualified employees. As of today, there's a limited insight on reliable and recognizable skills and credentials on the part of job applicants. Educators want to ensure that they are offering the competencies that manufacturers desire, but suffer from limited and consistent knowledge of the needs of those manufacturers. Today, our panel of experts has, has worked to address these issues and will share insights on programs and activities underway to help US manufacturers compete globally with a skilled and ready workforce. So to begin our set of presentations, let me back up just a second. If you have questions for the panel, we're gonna, we're gonna, we have a few of our own that we're gonna ask, but please put them in the chat box and we'll get them delivered to the, to the panel. Anyway, our first 
speaker today is Robin Fernkus. She's Deputy Administrator of the Office of Workforce Investment at the U.S. Department of Labor. And Robin, I'm going to let you introduce yourself in more detail. Great. Thank you, Jay. And thank you, everyone, for having me today. I'm really excited about being here to share some information about the resources and programs that make up the public workforce system. Um, we contribute to your efforts in the private sector of growing your regional economies and building a strong um, manufacturing and you know, aerospace workforce. So I'm also really excited personally, I was sharing this before the panel began because my 15 year old has a long standing passion in aviation and he plans to be a pilot in the future. So <laughs> it's exciting to, to be a part of this event. I think everyone can agree that this has been a really extraordinarily challenging time for our nation's economy. Prior to the pandemic, it was not uncommon for us to be hearing, um, you know, that there were a million job vacancies and that employers were experiencing skill gaps or mismatches between what the open jobs and the skills in our workforce. And while some of that, I mean, we're still hearing that today, I think yesterday's jobs report gave us a lot of encouragement that our economic recovery is underway. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, if you missed it, reported that we added 559,000 jobs in the month of May and that our unemployment rate ticked downward to 5.8%. So that's the lowest it's been since March of 2020. Um, so our, our programs are really designed to help employers find workers to fill current demand, but also to upskills workers, you know, to help workers ret retrofit their skills to remain competitive in this economy and to build a pipeline of new workers. So backfilling those who are retiring and leaving the labor market. Uh, I think if we go to the first slide, I'll tell you a little more about the labor department funds a network of 2,400 American job centers that are located across the country to assist thousands of businesses in recruiting, hiring, training, or upskilling your workforce. These centers also help job seekers. So for those of you who may be um, looking for jobs yourselves out there, you can find um, free training and um, access to um, assistance with your uh, job search. But the centers are overseen by workforce development boards and these boards are led by private sector business representatives that set priorities for your community's training investments to meet your regional labor market demand. So in Nevada or in La the Los Angeles area, I'm assuming that your, your business representatives are gonna be very focused on the manufacturing sector as well as aerospace. Um, there's business service representatives at each of these American job centers, and they offer a range of customized training options. Um, they provide information about your, our, your local resources as well as federal resources that can help businesses with decisions, um, marketing decisions, as well as um, economic de development decisions about where to locate a plant or um, you know, knowing more about the, the workforce in your area to know um, if they have the skills that would be needed. So we know businesses are looking to recruit workers right now with specific skills. And we'd encourage you to contact your American Job Center to, and to find the nearest one. I did provide a link in um, the slide presentation. So if we go on to the next slide, I may, be, uh, I may be ahead of myself a little bit in my, <laughs> or behind, I guess, in terms of my talking points. But 
Uh, one thing I did want to point out is that the American Job Centers are not limited to just helping people with filling current vacancies. So if you're really looking for a strategic partner that can help you more broadly with some of your workforce needs, um, I'd suggest you start with a conversation with your workforce development board. And they, um, you know, do are looking to ensure that employers have the talent they need. They also um, work on sector-based initiatives. So they form sector partnerships with industry representatives um, and can help, you know, develop customized training programs based on, on those needs. So we do have several examples of um, ways in which these either the workforce development boards or some of our competitive grants through the that are available through the Department of Labor have addressed needs in the aerospace manufacturing sector. One grant um, that I was gonna note that, that is at least on the West Coast, it's in the state of Washington, but there um, we gave almost a million dollars to the Aerospace Machinist Joint Training Committee and they are looking to train 830 apprentices and expand their apprenticeship opportunities um, in that area, looking at industrial maintenance mechanics, tool and die makers, some frontline supervisions of production workers. So I think um, just to give you kind of a flavor of the types of training, we're really focused primarily on training technicians and those needing more than a secondary um, education, but maybe less than a four-year degree. So one trend that we are hearing, and I'm sure that you all are seeing, is that there has been an uptick in, in automation during the pandemic. And this means, obviously, that certain jobs really require a different skill set um, from the ones that people may have had traditionally. And so looking at a proficiency in math and digital literacy skills um, to work in an increasingly digitized environment. So these are the types of programs that the Department of Labor has been funding. Um, we do offer through the workforce boards and American Job Centers um, incumbent worker training. So if you're looking to reskill your current workforce and maybe that's to help avert some um, layoffs, you know, if, if you're trying to retrofit your current workforce. We do provide on a limited basis some reimbursement to employers to cover the extraordinary cost of training those new hires. Um, in many cases, our workforce investments are supporting work-based learning or on-the-job training activities with employer partners. And a big focus for us has been on apprenticeships. So apprenticeships um, are really an industry-driven, high, high quality career pathway program where employers can develop and prepare their workforce and individuals um, get to earn while they are participating in classroom instruction. They also earn a portable credential along with a paycheck. Pre-apprenticeship training is also an authorized youth program activity that we have. Um, but I think the, the pyramid that you're looking at on this slide is what we call our industry competency model. And so we recognize that you know, for many high skill and in-demand industry sectors, there can be a real disconnect between um, what the industry needs and the existing educational curricula. And so um, to address these challenges, the Department of Labor has been working with industry associations as well as educational institutions and others to develop industry competency models as kind of the starting point for workforce development initiatives and sector partnerships. So, the model that you're looking here is for the mechatronics competency model. And as you can see, um, 
the layers in here, it's kind of hard to read because they're small text, but the point of it is that as you go up in the pyramid, you get more um, specialized for that industry. And so it's kind of saying that, you know, at the bottom, we have some essential skills or foundational skills that every industry needs. And then as you go up, they become more, more specialized. So we have worked um, most recently with semi or semi, sorry, um, works, and they are um, really building a talent pipeline for the semiconductor industry. And so that is, that's our most recent competency model that you will find if, when you go to the competency model clearinghouse. Um, but really, these competency models are a way of ensuring that education and training are really aligned with industry needs, and we hope to attract more students and job seekers to careers in advanced manufacturing as well as other industries through this um, approach. So in our final slide, just wanted to say that our the underpinning for all of our quality training and education programs is really robust labor market information on the jobs that are in demand, the skills and credentials needed for those jobs, and information on um, training to obtain those skills. So I think through our onestop.org website, you can find labor market, career information, links to several types of state and local labor exchange services, and information on transferable skills, like for our dis displaced workers who are needing to change careers right now. Um, we also provide extensive occupational data through ONET, and this is used um, by several employers to, again, establish those competency models that I was referring to, and also to really identify competencies needed for a cluster of different occupations. So in closing, I hope that you're gonna engage with your state and local workforce development boards as strategic partners, and that you will use many of the resources available to you through the nation's American job centers. And as I said, definitely located in the Los Angeles as well as the, the Nevada area. Um, working collaboratively, we really um, believe that we can respond to employer demand and offer dynamic job training solutions that are generating positive results. So I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Karen. Uh, that was great. Robin, I'm sorry. I'm looking at next week's list. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. That was great. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Lucas. Uh, he's Vice President of Aviation, Manufacturing, and Institutional Effectiveness at the Wichita State University Campus of Applied Science and Technology. Uh, go ahead, Scott. Thanks, Jay. Um, appreciate everyone's time. Um, good morning, I guess. Uh, it's afternoon for, for those of us on the panel. Um, little little background uh, on me real quick. Um, this is my sixth year as vice president in a career tech aviation manufacturing arena. This is um, coming up on my 18th year at the college. Um, WSU Tech, is, as we're known, is a two-year public technical college uh, located here in Wichita. And um, although I know there's, you know, all, all of you aviation folks that are on this, are, are proud of your aviation and everything, but Wichita, we are the air capital of the world. Um, and, and that is quote unquote, and I think we have that trademarked. So I, I can say that, um, but um, very proud of the aviation industry that we have here in Wichita and everything aviation related that's, that's going on here um, specific to that. Um, as a, as a two-year college, just, just to give you the background, um, you know, our job is to, to train and prepare the technicians um, to, really, to really build the airplanes, to prepare the manufacturing industry, because um, that's what pretty much what we do here in Wichita. 
um, both on the commercial side and the business jet side. We don't really, there's some defense work, but it really is pretty much um, Textron and um, Spirit Aerosystems, which is, which is Boeing, um, and, and then some Airbus. Um, but that's kind of what Wichita looks like today. Uh, it is always changing. Uh, which is a good thing. It is, it is kind of getting more diverse as far as what aerospace looks like in Wichita, um, which is completely different than what it looked like um, 18 years ago when I first came to town, um, especially since Boeing is no longer in Wichita, technically. Um, so, so it is interesting. WSU Tech, we are affiliated with Wichita State University, but we are still a standalone public two-year technical college. Uh, I'm coming to you today from the National Center for Aviation Training. Uh, it's a facility that was built specifically to, um, 11 years ago for aviation training. Um, it, it is a, a, a phenomenal example of how industry, government, education, all really came together to make a, a model of how this can work for a community. And, and so uh, the building that I'm in today is actually owned by the county. Uh, we're standing in, um, on land that at one time was owned by the city. And so um, that's the, the government aspect of this. Um, the, the county buildings that we are in, it's 250,000 square feet facility that's only for aviation and manufacturing training, uh, was built through county tax-based funding. Um, and the, the dirty little secret is it did cost some county commissioners their seats eventually. Um, but uh, it did happen uh, and it was driven completely by industry. Industry came to, um, government leaders uh, really about 15 years ago, a little longer than that, and said uh, with the baby boomer piece that was building as far as workforce, they understood that uh, there's this, this giant hole that was going to happen in their workforce and something needed to happen. And so there was enough foresight to say, let's build a training center that will always have options to help build our workforce for the future specific to aviation and manufacturing. And that was really the birth of NCAT as we call it, uh, the National Center for Aviation Training. So we have um, two big buildings that sit behind me. Uh, you can kind of see the top of one behind me. Uh, one is what, is really aviation specific, one is manufacturing specific, but it, it kind of blends depending on the programs. Uh, because when we built the facility at the time, we didn't really have a, a true mix of, of aviation manufacturing programs. We had some of the traditional programs, but when we developed the facility, we actually developed programs specific for NCAT. So programs like industrial automation, um, and maintenance and robotics, um, non-destructive testing, NDT. Uh, those programs were developed along with the actual, you know, building of the building. Um, so those things were put into place. We worked with the state of Kansas to get those programs through. They supported those programs. Again, the government coming to support this as far as the example um, and provided a $5 million grant annually to build, uh, to supply equipment into those programs so that we always have really cutting edge, um, top of the line equipment to train those students that would eventually become the employees, the workers um, on those pieces of equipment. So most of the programs we have in here do focus primarily on manufacturing or um, some component of manufacturing, but we do also have uh, airframe and power plant that lives here too. We have one of the largest airframe and power plant programs in the country. Right now we have about 250 A&P students that go through our program annually. Um, and um, fingers crossed, we have a, a pilot program, which is kind of the last 
feather in the cap. We have a part 141 program that's um, sitting in the state capitol right now for final approval. And that kind of finishes what the last vision is a decade later now of what uh, NCAT looks like, but it is always kind of changing. We are always adapting programs based off of what the industry need is. Um, so we have developed over the last decade programs in aerospace coatings and paint. We have developed a predictive maintenance program on the maintenance side of things. So there are things that have happened specific to aviation and aerospace industry and manufacturing that have adapted over time. And then about a third of the facility uh, we run with partnership with Wichita State's National Institute for Aviation Research. So any of you that have, have any uh, work with, with NIAR, um, we do a lot of work with NIAR. They help us run. We have a full-blown CATIA program that we run our students through. Uh, they have a CATIA. We have three CATIA labs that we do here uh, with our programs. And then there, there are students that come in and out of, of the CATIA classes uh, that also go into um, NC programming and a variety of, of different areas specific to CATIA. CATIA is really all we kind of teach with regards to uh, 3D design, uh, which is from a two-year college perspective is different, but for, for you folks in aviation, you, you kind of understand that. But um, when, when I talk to my colleagues at other two-year colleges, uh, that's, that's definitely not the norm. So what we've done is really set up stackable curriculum options that lead to an associate degree. And stackable meaning it gives students options to come in and get out as quickly as possible to get to the workforce, but then they still have options to get to the associate degree. And ultimately, if they want to, they can continue on to a bachelor's degree if they want. Uh, most of them really honestly don't because they're here for a job. We are a technical college, um, but uh, we, we build two to three options as far as exit options for employment and as far as education. We also have built third party credentials within our program so students can um, validate and, and then ultimately on their resume when they're talked to employers to show that we are working through those third party credentials wherever possible. Um, and so what we've done is we've part partnered with certain organizations like the National Coalition of Certification Centers, which is NC3. Um, we provide the largest number of NC3 certifications of any single institution in the country. Um, that's, that's one that we do. And NC3 is a, is a unique example. And they work with specific companies like Sterrett for precision measuring, Lincoln Electric for welding. Um, we work with Daniels with precision wiring, which is a, a specific aerospace one when we do that. Termination, electric termination with Daniels. Um, so there are specific certifications that we have built in that we've worked with NC3. And probably the, the most recent one we've done is we work with, with Mike Rowe. Um, everyone kind of knows who Mike Rowe is, the dirty jobs guy. And we worked with the Mike Rowe Foundation and we developed a, um, a work ethics, employability skills certification that now students can validate that they have went through training to work through employability skills because it's not just technical training. We also realize that those going back to, um, you know, kind of Robin's pyramid of, of skills, that the foundation of those skills really start with their ability to show up on time, to work in teams, you know, to really do those those soft skills that everyone feels like is important, and we and we try to reinforce that through that training. Um, I noticed that AIAA, you know, you guys do a lot with with K through 12. That's one of our emphasis here at, at WSU Tech. We provide the most dual credit um, high school credit hours of any college in Kansas. We helped um, four years ago developed an aviation pathway in the state of Kansas. Um, that provides students access to aviation maintenance, aviation manufacturing, and then next year, pilot training specifically in the state of Kansas. So, next slide, please. So when we look at specifically about industry four workforce challenges, um, we really kind of ask ourselves four questions. 
And we always go back to the top question and, and it's what's best for our industry. And, and for us, it's, it's trying to know our specific market and, and in Wichita, it's obviously, we, we always go back to, to aviation and aerospace. Um, we, we were fortunate enough and it's, it's kind of why, why we're on this panel today is we received um, some funding through the ARM Institute that helped us really focus on industry four and focus really the first component of that research was to know our market with industry four and truly understand what was going on in our region. And, and in aerospace, it was um, the, the true answer is it really was a mixed bag here in, in South Central Kansas. Um, we have some of the, the larger companies like Spirit and Textron that have been doing some R&D and some things to drive industry four and to integrate more robotics into building airplanes. But then when you get into the supply chain aspects of that, it, it still looks very much like it did 20 years ago as far as um, the, the actual technology aspects of that. They know that they need to automate and to integrate and do different things, but they just weren't there when we did this study a couple of years ago. So that's why we look at, you know, what's, what's best for industry, understanding that. Now, when we step outside of aerospace, we, are, we do have some diversity here in Wichita. We have um, some agricultural manufacturing with um, Case New Holland, with a company called Agco. Um, we also have some uh, food manufacturing and some different aspects of that. And then, and then we always look at small to medium manufacturers as well and understand what those supply chain needs really look like and try to get that full gamut of, of what the market is really driving towards and what their needs look like. So then we take that information and we, and we try to translate that to say, well, what's, what's the best approach for, for us as far as instructing on that? So first and foremost is, is looking at the faculty uh, who do we have on staff? Do we have the right people? Do they have the right experience? Um, can we match that? Can we leverage these companies to help us with that? Is it credit? Is it non-credit? Is it quick? Is it a day? Is it a week? Is it a semester? Uh, those types of things. And then equipment. Um, obviously, when you start talking about robotics and industry four, um, equipment challenges because it is ever changing quickly um, with the technology. Um, we've been very fortunate, again, that the state has provided us uh, grant dollars to do that, as well as um, with the, the CARES funding and the HERF funding that has been here in the last um, 18 months, um, we've been able to really leverage that to help us improve what we're doing in industry for specifically to instruction. And then we look at method. Um, whether that is um, hybrid or whether that is looking at um, the mix that we're doing, how much lab time we are technical college. Uh, you, you can't necessarily teach what we teach completely online. They have to actually touch stuff. They actually have to work on stuff. They have to learn how to troubleshoot. Um, so that's it when we look at that. And then I'm a, I'm a public institution. So what, what can we actually afford to do? Um, you know, and a great example of that is, is one of the partners that, that we all work with, that some of us on the panel work with. Um, and they're, they're a great partner with us. They're a great partner with, with NC3 that I mentioned. Um, they have a, a phenomenal product. It, it's got a pretty high price tag on it. I, I can't do that. It's just, we've invested so much dollars in one thing and I can't pivot and go a different direction. So we have to work it with what we have um, just because again, it, it's public funding and, and we have to justify that at the end of the day. And then finally, and you know, I, I went to industry at the top and, and a lot of my educational colleagues would, would argue that we're, we're probably doing this backwards. But again, I think we have a unique approach here at WSU Tech in that we we do truly start with industry first, but we also have to consider the students. And so where do we get the students from? What are the students needs? Um, that's the workforce ultimately. So those are things that we've done. And so when we start asking those questions, we, we, we truly 
you know, we, we are limited here. Kansas is a, a negative growth state, meaning that, that we are sending people in Kansas to other states. Uh, we are, uh, Wichita is a, a zero growth area, which I guess is good news because the vast majority of, of the rest of the state is a, a negative, but uh, trying to find where the students come from. So next slide. So when we start answering those questions, again, the, the ARM research really aided us when we started looking at what's best for that. We, we reached out to over 60 companies. And again, that was a broad or very broad reach. And what we came up with is we, we were matched up really well in our industrial automation program when it came to industry four. Um, and so industrial automation was a good fit because it was more mechanical, it was more electrical. But when we looked at robotics, um, the robotics needs of industry still, they still really weren't there. So they needed more um, integration level, which is frankly, it, that's above what we do as, as we produce technicians. Um, so it's working then with um, NIAR because NIAR does do robotic integration with what they do. And then so we can provide the technicians to help NIAR um, and, and other integration companies to help these supply chain, small, medium sized manufacturers to, to look through that. And we've seen that actually grow really recently here in the last six to eight months. Um, and we've seen that both um, in aerospace specifically, but we've also seen that outside of aerospace in, in more, um, diversified areas. Uh, I, I mentioned Agco, which they make um, combines and um, hay equipment and a variety of agricultural equipment. And they have kind of the whole gamut of um, equipment when it comes to manufacturing. So we, we toured their, it took us uh, four hours to tour there and we walked the entire time. It was pretty amazing. Um, but they, they truly do have industry four and they, and they almost have industry two. Um, and, and it was, it was fun, but um, they, they did, you know, they have integration issues as well. And you're talking about a multi-billion dollar global company that still has some of the same issues that we're dealing with, with, with small medium manufacturers and we're working with them with the same approach. So when we look at instruction, you know, what, the ramifications of the pandemic, again, when we didn't have the capability of having students on campus, we did have to pivot and look at what we could do. And, and we were fortunate enough that we did have enough things and there, there has been development with, with simulation, with um, some AI technologies that um, we were able to supplement some of the instruction that we were doing to at least give us some pieces that we, we, we could do synchronously with students or asynchronously with students and then focus them on with their lab time when they were here. Um, and we, we're seeing a lot more of that with Industry 4 and, and a lot of our um, companies that we work with that provide the training equipment, uh, companies like um, Amatrol and Festo and um, company called APT, which works with um, FANUC robots, they develop instruction that goes with their equipment. And that's really helped us educational institutions because we don't have to then develop the curriculum on our own, which takes time uh, and resources, because then that comes to the next one is how do we invest in the future? Well, that, that's part of it is as we have to develop curriculum, it just takes a lot of time. Um, and so by having that, we, we truly have to invest in the future we just, uh, we just got a, a, a big Amazon um, warehouse here in Wichita, which is kind of new for us. But now, you know, that's, it, it's a big thing. Sensors, you know, sensors, understanding the flow of the sensors, looking through that, understanding, um, you know, we're not, we're not necessarily talking about assembly lines anymore. We're talking about the flow of logistics. It's a, it's a little different industry and how will that work? And so, understanding that so and, and where are, where are the students again you know the dual credit piece and and working through that has been uh, one piece that we've really leveraged and tried to leverage it as much as we can it did take a dip during the pandemic um, 
Wichita w was really hit hard pre-pandemic um, because you know we build the fuselage for the 737 Max. So we actually, you know, that line was shut down prior to the pandemic, and then with the pandemic on top of it, um, you know, we really felt the impact of that, and so we actually shut our adult assembly program down, and our high school assembly program really, I mean, it went from about, we had about 60 students in that a year, and it went to 10. So just to give you a, a, some, some insight into what that looks like, it's ramping back up now slowly, but um, it, it, it is a driving force when the economy takes a dip like that, that it, it does resonate down into student interest. Um, so we kind of have to build that back up and we've, we're working with a variety of high schools to really get that back up. Another thing that we're doing is, is adjusting our schedules and adjusting our models where we can integrate applied learning, which, you know, Robin minute, uh, mentioned um, apprenticeships. So applied learning for us is the same concept as apprenticeships. It's just, it just flexes it a little bit differently. So we have things like earn and learn models where um, students can come to class for two days a week and then go work in their specific field three days a week. So we've done that in a variety of manufacturing. We've adjusted our industrial maintenance program. Next year, we're, we're adjusting our robotics program. So we can have those type of models that give students that hands-on approach because what we've really found out, and, and, and again, it kind of goes back to a lot of the work that we're doing with, with the ARM Institute and a lot of what's happening in industry four is that the job of the technician just continues to grow. And what industry wants out of the technician is, is really, it's really big. Well, I, I only, you know, I have 60 credit hours. I only have them here for a, a finite amount of time. So if I can supplement that time with their, you know, them actually going into industry and working while they're in school, it's just it's a valuable piece that we can add to to their training to their education and what industry then gets is is a, honestly it's a, it's a phenomenal uh, worker that's the goal and so we've integrated that not not only in industry four programs but we're in, we're even in in some of our more traditional programs like welding you know we're doing that in welding we've had a really successful model in welding um, that we used a, a grant through Metallica. Yep, that Metallica, um, where we did that specifically with, with women in welding. Um, and we, we sent five ladies uh, to a specific company and they were there uh, in the afternoons and they took class in the morning and it was a, a great example. So um, we did have a, a question on uh, funding. So just I, I just throw out one example that we that we did. Um, for funds, because most most of our, our aerospace assembly, whether it's composites, um, our process mechanic, which is um, kind of our non sheet metal program, and then our our, um, our true assembly sheet metal program, um, we we dump a ton of scholarship dollars in there. The community dumps a ton of scholarship dollars in there, and um, one great example is uh, we, we developed a program called the Wichita Promise Move program. And we uh, marketed that program outside of Wichita. So a hundred miles outside of Wichita. And we brought in um, 92 people from outside the community. And most of them were out of state. And uh, they went to school for free. They lived in Wichita for free. They got weekly stipends, they got transportation to and from school. And after they successfully completed the program, um, they got employment. So, um, and I, we had two students out of the 92 that, that were not successful. This all happened pre-pandemic. So um, unfortunately, during the pandemic, you know, it didn't turn out so well, but it was a very successful story as far as the funding aspect of how it can be done. And th this was community dollars that we supplemented with our own scholarship dollars. I 
think I think that's it. Okay, me. thanks, Scott. Yeah, you um, bet. Let's uh, let's move it on. Um, our next speaker is Lisa Massiantonio, my colleague at the ARM Institute. Lisa is the Chief Workforce Officer at ARM. Uh, go ahead, Lisa. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us today, and thanks for taking time out of your Saturday uh, to spend some time. Hopefully, we enlighten you, and hopefully, through our question and answers, uh, you'll help to enlighten us. So as Jay said earlier, uh, ARM Institute is one of 16 federally funded um, institutes across the country to focus on bringing manufacturing back to the United States and to strengthen it uh, with what we learn across all of our institutes. Um, we are built of a very small team, but we are strengthened by our membership. So we've got over 300 organizations, uh, including um, Scott's team, including Robin's team, um, to help us drive where the body of knowledge that we're building and the capabilities that we bring uh, are, are fair and balanced across our whole ecosystem. And, and we're made up of um, academic organizations and government organizations, uh, very large manufacturers, uh, very small, uh, medium-sized manufacturers, a lot of not-for-profits, manufacturing extension partnerships, um, you name it, they're part of our ecosystem. And so uh, our key goal is when we're um, strengthening the technological side of manufacturing, what we really have to focus on is how do we strengthen the workforce at that same pace? Um, if, if you heard what Scott and Robin were talking about, um, there's something called a skills gap out there that um, is showing that there's either a mismatch in skills or there are a lot of jobs open. So some of your large aerospace companies at any given time might have 12,000 technician jobs open, which obviously is going to slow down their throughput and uh, their productivity at the end of the day. Um, we also wanna focus on how do we um, ensure the academic organizations are ready to go with their courses um, as technologies are changing and the world is advancing as it's related to robotics and automation. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to repeat what uh, Scott said much better than I can, but with Industry 4.0, those needs are changing. And we want to make sure we're figuring out in each market sector um, how to help influence and how, how to um, utilize the Department of Defense's money um, to help move the workforce forward uh, in an appropriate pace. Um, and the other thing is, it's not just happening now. We know it's going to continue to happen. Um, and so um, we're in a very unique position um, because if you look across all of the manufacturing sectors, robotics and automation are the wave of uh, today and of the future. Um, and so we, we really get a great opportunity where we sit um, to help influence what is changing and, and how we can build those solutions together. Um, and so over the next couple of minutes, I'll tell you specifically where we are and a couple of our solution sets. Um, so here's just a depiction of what key challenges um, are out there and, and none of them should be a surprise to this audience. So the first thing is that the US education is currently insufficient um, to put people into those industry 4.0 career pathways. Um, and I would even add, how do we get them into the career pathways quickly? So as Scott was saying, uh, you'll see a greater trend in these micro-credentials or these um, small, quick um, courses to get people in and then to move up their career pathways um, by building additional capabilities either on the job or through some of these shorter stackable course credentials. Um, the other big problem um, that we see, and hopefully we're starting to influence some change, is negative perceptions about robotics and manufacturing. For many, many years, uh, manufacturing was leaving the United States. So um, your parents and your grandparents were probably saying, please don't get into manufacturing because I was there, grandpa was there, and everybody got laid off. And the whole town, uh, their whole business paradigm had to change because of manufacturing. Um, you'll hear people talking about dirty, dull, dangerous jobs. Um, with the, uh, the um, intentional um, adaptation of robots and automation, 
those challenges are going away. They're actually very safe now. Um, you know, people can be in those jobs and continue to move up in that lifelong learning journey, um, but those perceptions are still there. Um, the small and medium manufacturers in particular, um, but I wouldn't exclude the large manufacturers, um, they just have limited resources to prepare people um, to move up in their career pathway. They can't very easily take people off the line to take training. Um, they may not know exactly how to get people into different levels of um, specialties. They don't know what training exists out there that map to those new capabilities that they want to drive their uh, workforce towards. Um, the manufacturing workforce in general, it's not continue, not prepared for continual reskilling. And that um, piggybacks off of what I was talking about with the small and medium. Um, it used to be that once you got into a manufacturing career, um, you honed in on a specialization. Um, and it, you'll probably remember the, the um, old mindset of a, a apprentice, a journeyman, and a master, where now it's a lifelong learning journey and the skills and the needs are changing on a very, very quick basis. And so we've got to help those people um, to continually to get reskilled in a way that it doesn't cripple the business from taking people um, out of the workforce um, to get back into the educational tracks. Um, there's very little coordination um, between initiatives with relation to Industry 4.0. And I would say this is probably the number one request uh, we find from the workforce side of our membership. Um, both Scott and Robin um, sit on our Education and Workforce Advisory Committee. Um, and from a technological standpoint, what we do is we um, give money to programs, as Scott was describing, to enhance their capabilities and move them into higher manufacturing readiness level. From an education and workforce standpoint, um, what we were finding when we were investing money through our membership early was um, we may have inadvertently been creating competition uh, or um, investing in things that uh, we didn't know existed. And so one of the big requests as a national institute for us was, um, can you help us define the landscape? What is the uh, current landscape across the country related to robotics training? And um, when you look at the biggest um, challenge, it is at the robotic technician level. So we didn't wanna boil the ocean. So we're really uh, initially focused on um, the mechanics and the electrical part of the robotic technician um, field and the pathways. And then finally, um, as I said, is our, our probably our biggest challenge is that the technology is outpacing uh, the skills development um, and that's leading to those regional skill gaps. And we want to figure out what solutions uh, we might be able to bring to bear to help shorten that skills gap and to make sure uh, it doesn't continue to grow over the next 10 years. So um, we have, over the last couple of years, worked with organizations in our membership to create a capability called roboticscareer.org. Um, it is a site that is live and it's free for anybody to use. Um, right now, it will um, show something similar to what Robin um, showed in her um, competency framework earlier, that pyramid chart. Um, we have one that is specifically focused on Industry 4.0 capabilities. Um, and from those capabilities, um, it drives people into three different pathways. At the foundational level, all of your basic operator and maintenance um, capabilities. Um, we will help drive people into the right training paths across the country um, at that first career path level. Um, and then you would be moving into a more specialized level. So let's say um, it, maybe you're on the uh, electrical side of the system path. Uh, that would show the capabilities to become more specialized in the robotic technician field. And then finally, at the highest level of the pyramid, one of the things we learned from the employers um, that was really crippling them is they would buy a robot that decide to automate something, but then the, the systems integrator would go on to their next job. And they were finding that the robots were not being used well 
or as they added other systems, they didn't know how to make them work together and they didn't know how to move it forward uh, technologically. And so there's a big push right now to get some of those um, people who have gone through these pathways uh, or maybe with some engineering capabilities um, to start to focus on um, those higher, techni higher technical challenges, um, things like the sensors and vision systems, um, advanced programming. Those are all of the competencies that we're helping people to understand where are the training um, capabilities to move me into that part of the pathway. Um, when you look at the roboticscareer.org um, platform, it has over 10,000 um, programs across the country um, representing maybe 2,000 um, training organizations. If you yourself happen to be a training organization and you've got curricula that maps to um, the competencies, it is absolutely free for you to get your information into the system. So if you go to roboticscareer.org, up in the upper right-hand corner, there are some uh, buttons that you would push. Um, so we welcome you to put any of your information in there. If you're looking forward to uh, some other advanced training, again, it is uh, completely free for you to use uh, and to find and leverage some of these training programs. Um, the next activity that um, people in our membership asked us to do was to build a uh, endorsement program. And this is an audit. So there is a very robust application where we would make a recommendation uh, for some improvements at that point. And if you meet certain threshold, um, you would move forward in the endorsement program. Um, Scott's uh, program at uh, WSU Tech is one of our early uh, pilots for this. They, they passed with flying colors, obviously. And so if you look um, at their program in roboticscareer.org, you'll see they have this um, special badge that you see there um, that they can use in their website or their marketing collateral. And they are designated as um, one of the superstars across the country um, for a period of three years. And, and there are instructions if you're interested in having your program endorsed or to find endorsed programs um, that are, it's very user-friendly to find that information. Uh, another activity that we're working on um, with the Office of the Secretary of Defense and across our membership is there are a lot of people in the workforce who have been there for many, many years, but they haven't gotten any kind of formal resume builder or credential next to their name. And so um, when you look at the competencies, the 26 competencies in our framework, if somebody believes that they are able um, to test out, we are creating a virtual reality environment um, for those individuals to be able to go into the website and test out. We are kicking off that program um, as a uh, beta pilot right now, uh, looking at the proof of concepts and which virtual reality capabilities. So stay tuned for that. Um, but we really heard loud and clear from the employers and some of the longstanding employees um, that this is something that is really important to them, as well as new people coming in uh, as they get those stackable credentials um, some of them um, may not have the certification that goes with it. And so we wanna make sure that they're able to tout those skills. Um, we are also working at the request of our employers um, to design this system to help us with job matchmaking. What we found in evaluating a lot of the other um, uh, job sites is that they're, they're very weak at finding um, the organizations who are looking at the robot technician fields um, and, and they kind of get lost in the shuffle. So we wanna um, narrow down the, the field for the employees to find these jobs, as well as create things like a job description wizard for the employers to be able to use. Um, what we heard um, in, in all of the size organizations and all parts of the country is, uh, I've used basically the same job description for the last 20 years, and it doesn't specialize um, somebody working on a mechanical side versus an electrical side versus a, a fluid power side. This would be really great um, for me to have a diverse set of um, operators and then really help my people move uh, up so that they don't leave my company and go elsewhere. So we were honing in on that job matchmaking, which then obviously uh, between the assessment um, credentialing 
it, it lends itself to uh, track personal um, careers for the individuals uh, as they become a little bit more mature in the manufacturing environment. So I am going to show you a very short video. Um, it will help to explain how we're supporting the training organizations, the employees or the education seekers and the employers through this short video. Uh, this uh, is it possible to to turn up the volume? Yeah, can't hear. Can hear. Uh, Lisa, we cannot hear the, the sound from the video. It's very low volume. If you click the video itself, there should be a place you can increase the uh, the volume from the from the uh, the file. Not there. I mean, click on the video itself in the middle. Were you all able to hear that? No, Not very clear. Oh. Couldn't hear it at all. I mean, it's possible we could direct people to the ARM website where they could get the. I'll put the website in the chat. I apologize. Yeah, please do that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so put it in the chat, Lisa. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess that was the end of your presentation. Uh, we have um, about 22, 23 minutes left. Um, I wanted to see if Lisa and uh, Robin had anything to add to the question of, you know, students often don't have money or and where can you get free resources for you know, training and upskilling? Did you have anything to add to Scott's comments? Uh, Robin, we'll start with you. Yeah, I, I had added or responded in the chat. I, I wanted to make sure that our audience knows that all of the labor department fund, um, programs are free to the public. So um, there are training programs available that are free to the public and you can access those by going to that website that I provided, the Career One Stop website. Um, and then we also have apprenticeship opportunities and we've created a, a website for people to find apprenticeship opportunities. And those are also free opportunities. And then um, as Scott mentioned, there's, there's programs too through the local community colleges. Um, a lot of colleges offer some of their programs um, free of charge and, you know, those can help lead to a um, either an industry recognized credential or a, a academic certificate. So, okay, thank you, Robin. Lisa, did you have anything to add to that? No, I, I think what Robin and Scott talked about is is uh, definitely uh, encompasses everything. Okay, great. Real quick, Jay, there are, I mean, most, 
most states or even cities or, or systems now have some type of free or discounted, at least for two-year colleges. You know, in California, there's, there is some two-year college system. I'm not completely familiar with it, but I know there is California Community College has um, two-year some free aspects of it. So, I mean, it, it may not encompass everyone and it may be limited to certain income levels and certain things, but, but most two-year colleges do have some kind of elements of, of at least reduced or free um, tuition. Okay, great. Yeah, I think, yeah uh, can you see the question? Well, I think Sherry can uh, speak up. Jay, is that okay if it's attendee speak or asking question? Sure. Um, I, I don't see. If you see the participants, uh, you can see people raise hand, you can unmute them. But right now, uh, Miss Sherry Tan, she has a question. Okay, Sherry, go ahead. Shirley. Um, as I was listening to Scott's presentation about Mike Rose's uh, workforce ethics class, obviously, a uh, class that would be interest to nationwide and part of the Department of Labor you know, workforce competency. I just thought maybe what's the possibility of having that replicated so that it's available in more than just the Wichita area. And he's a very popular person, so the class might be very popular. Just, just a suggestion seemed like a nice best current practice that would be useful in lots of places. That's the basic suggestion that I was thinking of. Okay, great. Thank you, Shirley. Any specific response, Scott? <laughs> Um, well, right now it, it's it's through NC3 National Coalition of Certification Center, so you, you do have to be an NC3 member for that. And, and again, there are systems that are I know the uh, entire state of Tennessee, entire state of Kansas, Wisconsin. Some of those systems are. Um, it just rolled out. They did the pilot uh, in the fall, and it, it kind of rolled out. So each institution, but there are other models out there. We we did a model. Um, Prior to doing micro, we did one that was called Bring Your A Game, that is the, through the Center for Work Ethics. So there are there are other educational models that that kind of do a similar thing. I, I hear what you're saying, Shirley, as far as capturing micro, and and honestly, that was one of the the things that uh, we really focused on as well. Um, but I think the the focus is, you know. We can't do it alone anymore and just focus on technical training that we have to continue to work on these basic competencies of workplace ethics, employability skills, soft skills, and build that into curriculum as, as we go. And that it has to start somewhere. Yeah, and the suggestion was to help amplify the impact to a larger audience. and. And what I had heard about institution being able to offer their offerings sounds like a great idea and that more groups should be doing that so you have cross training. And now that most training is virtual, uh, the location dependency isn't as critical. So um, just trying to get more people trained. Right. Thank you, Shirley. Um, if anybody has any other questions, let, let us know. We got a, I've got a few of my own. I want to change it up a little bit, everybody. I want to do a little bit of rapid fire here. So um, let's keep the answers short because we're going to try to get a few more of these in before we run out of time. So I'm a student. I'm trying to upskill myself. I want to get a better job in manufacturing. What's the one course I should take? Robin? Forgive me for putting you on the spot. Yeah, I was going to say, I think um, <laughs> I'm probably the least least informed about this in terms of it. Scott and, and uh, Lisa probably know more. So I right. well, okay. Let's go to in Scott. terms of the courses. It's easy. It's micro work ethics. 
I'm sorry. Micro, it's the micro work ethics. Uh, okay, great. You know, really, honestly, um, we've we've had to start integrating um, basic measuring, basic hand tools into our curriculum now because that uh, students aren't coming with those skills. They used to come with those skills because they would learn it either as a hobby with tinkering in a garage or you know in a shop class, and they don't get that necessarily in before coming to college. And so we've started to have to integrate that now. Great. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Um, hey, we have a question from Randall. Um, this is a great question. How well do these programs work for older employees? Some of which have foundation skills, but may not be up to date on the latest and greatest. Does this require a different approach for maximum benefit? I would I say that's, that's the yeah. ideal student right there. That mm -hmm. I, the, the people coming in with the desire, the core capabilities, um, and and being able to figure out which pathway makes the most sense for them, um, they're they're coming in right at the right time. Target rich. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna agree with that. I we have tried to fund a lot of programs at the Department of Labor that. Um, for people like um, you, Randall, or, or people that you're talking about who have some work experience already and want to build on that work experience, we've funded several programs where we call Designed to Give Credit for Prior Learning, and that learning can happen in the workplace. And so I would say a lot of our programs are designed with, with um, people in mind who you know, older workers or seasoned workers that have some work experience. Hey, thanks, Robin. Okay, we have another hand raised. Uh, uh, Victor, Victor Cook, you have a question for us? Uh, yeah, I was wondering, uh, I'm an older worker now. I work for Lockheed in, in, uh, in Dallas, Dallas location. But I started out most of my uh, career in California. Uh, and I noticed, uh, you know, the, the older type of worker programs they had back then was uh, 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 you know, taking the students to the factory and stuff for like a couple of years and stuff after school and introduce them to you know factory work, what they're doing and stuff. We got a chance to train with those guys for two or three hours a night and stuff. And uh, when I went started working for uh, Douglas Aircraft Company, I had to join a local 148. And they had a training program in there and they seemed to work with like the state of California's unemployment office in some kind of way uh but uh so, so what's your how did you guys interact with those type of uh situation where you got a local unions training you know for the factory train workers for the factory on all different aspects sheet metal uh you know welding all that kind of stuff is trained there and you keep your training records i mean you have a system to advance throughout the say production line you can go from like one type of inspector to all the way out to the Delivery center inspector and stuff like that, and and, and of course the, the union, the, the companies offer training too. You know, um, they offer tuition assistance for those that wanted to go to college and say increase the industrial engineering, uh, industrial manufacturing skills. Uh, do you guys like the department, the U.S. Department of Labor? Do you guys interact with? Do you guys have any tie-in with that, or do you guys assist those? Do you work in coordination with them or adjacent to them, alongside them to? Uh, retain the workforce as far as, you know, uh, the manufacturing workforce, uh, you know, the guys on the line, uh, and maybe even up to, you know, supervision. How do how, how you guys, uh, you guys have any type of those uh, type uh, training systems, those type union, like union, unions and stuff like that? What's your, what's your relation with the unions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we either provide funding to the states, like, to California, as you're saying. So our funding would go to the state um, department of, um, it's called different things in each state. Um, so, and then um, with the unions, we might provide funding directly through our competitive grant programs, or we would provide funding to um, say partnership programs where a union's working with a community college and a local workforce board and um, an employer. 
and they may apply for funding to provide, you know, some skills training to their employees. Um, I mean, some of these programs are privately funded, and I mean, the public the public workforce system is is probably a small fraction of what the private sector spends on on training, um, but we can, you know, we can support the private sector's efforts. Actually, so that's how they was getting funded then. I was wondering about, because I mean, the company provided some funding because, you know, facilities and equipment mm -hmm. and stuff like that. <clears throat> but the, uh, the core funding, the core training and stuff like that wasn't coming from the company, it's coming from the union somehow. Mm-hmm, yeah. It's usually a combination. <laughs> yeah, I know my, my, well, my local is, uh, is uh, maybe deactivated now because you know, McDonnell Douglas went to Boeing and and they held those for a little while in Long Beach from the C-17 program. I'm not sure if they're still there or not, but uh, uh, so those programs are still going active like up in the Washington, Seattle area, right? Seattle, Washington area is still. Yeah, and the, yeah, in fact, the example I gave was um, a labor organization that had applied for the funding. And so um, a lot of the unions are still involved in a lot of the apprenticeship programs and as you know the employers might sponsor those programs or the the labor organizations may sponsor them and and that's a they're they've remained very involved in that so as far as the national transportation system goes uh, specifically in airline operation is, so is there is there a big shortage in uh, say uh, technicians mechanics in the, the airline you know the Transportation system itself, overall, how, how big of how big of a gap? How, you know, what's the how how are they how they look? You know, are they really short or maintenance? Yeah, maintenance. It's huge, mm -hmm. and it's just mm -hmm. going to continue to grow. It's it's an older it's an older workforce, and especially in the pandemic, um, what we what we saw at least through our research was. Um, and they just got bought out and retired. And we, well, we can't. Yeah, so it's really, yeah, so a guy like me, like I'm 65 now, but if I decide to go say at 70, what's the age? Do they have an age limitation on when you can, if you want to go back and, and pull some maintenance in one of the airlines, uh, is there an age limitation on that? No. Okay. Not for an A&P. Yeah, okay, I was just curious. In fact, a lot of companies now are looking at different programs where they, um, you know, they might provide um, a modified work schedule for some of the older workers, and they might have uh, mentoring built in as part of their, the time that they get, you know, paid time that they actually get to, to work. Yeah. Um, the recognition that they're building, you know, that's part of their succession planning. Right, so because I was I was thinking, you know, for guys like me, that you know, maybe because you got to find something to do after retirement. So I retired from Lockheed up at, up mm -hmm. at seventy in, in McDonald Douglas already. <laughs> so if I had nothing to do, you know, I was thinking it's better to go back. It'd probably be easier for me to go to one of the airlines to pull maintenance, you know. And also that'd be sort of a way to get some of the old guys to give back. You know, if they don't have anything to do. You could teach. Don't have anything to do with the okay at seventy. But if you're still teacher. able, right? So if you're still able and physically, teach. Physically, what's that? Be a teacher. Come be a teacher. Be a teacher. Right, right. And so I, you know, that's what I was looking at. Um, yeah, they have some yeah. opportunities around here. I was maybe look to pursue, you know, in teaching or A and P. Yeah, you could teach at your community college. You could also look at being a mentor to an apprentice. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, I have. Excellent, I have Excellent of your advice. Thank you, Victor. I appreciate. Um, it. For your question. Yeah, so we're almost out of time. I wanted to give our three panelists uh, one quick uh, a note to the group. Uh, what's your best advice? Scott, want to start? Sure. Um, I, I think when we look at, at industry four, the, the fun part is um, we're, we're just on the cusp and it's just going to continue to grow and continue to grow and what it looks like today is not what it's going to look like tomorrow. Um, so it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, that's probably about all I can say is um, it's it, what, what things are, where we're going is, is truly going to be interesting and uh, especially for aerospace. Yeah. 
I think that's Great. it. Thanks, Scott. Robin? I would just say partnership and, you know, um, so definitely don't try to do these things on your own. We definitely recommend, you know, partnerships between the public and private sectors and with your education partners. Um, and then also just avail yourself of the re resources that are out there because they are free to you and we would love for people to use them. Super. Yeah, and my advice is very similar. Um, make sure that you understand what resources are out there. There are a lot of them. Um, and it's, it's sometimes you feel like you don't know where to turn first, um, but it is a fast, fun, furious uh, set of changes that are taking place. So uh, if there is a way to advance and to stay, um, whether it be through uh, working for a manufacturer or teaching, um, it's, a, it's a career field that is going uh, up and it's going to be around for a long time. So it's a great time to make the change into, uh, especially with all of the aerospace side of the house into the robotics and uh, automation side of things. Great, thanks, Lisa. So uh, that's gonna wrap it up for us. Uh, Robin, Scott, Lisa, thank you very much. Thank you, AIAA, and thank you all for listening and for the great questions. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Ken. Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thank you so much, Jay, and uh, Lisa, Robin, Scott. <clears throat> Actually, I listed a page of questions, but uh, I will follow up with you afterwards. And uh, the most of the thing is, we have been doing some local events regarding to robotics, manufacturing, machine learning, um, automation, those kinds of things. But, you know, I just want, we can do more events, <clears throat> but uh, just wondering, you know, for the local level, you know, as Robin said, you know, uh, Las Vegas and uh, uh, Los Angeles area, if something at the level and the national level, is anything AIWA could do. Uh, so I'll follow up with you. I think there's uh, a lot of things, you know, we can work together. Yeah, stay in touch. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.